It's time for Paleo Radio, only on Secular Media Network. You are now entering Paleo Radio. Oh my gosh, we love doing this so much, not gonna lie. My name is Jeremiah Bannister. And I'm Joe Elder. And you're listening to Paleo Radio, broadcasting right here in the beautiful Grand Rapids. Actually, today, guys, Election Day, right? Yes, it is. It's Election Day. Did you go out and vote, Joe? I did not. I'm not a primary voter. Never have been. You know, I know Ed Brayton's not either uh, over at Patheos. He isn't either. I went out and voted today. My wife went out and voted. Actually... Uh, Nathan brought me to the voting uh, station today, the precinct, went in and voted. First time that I voted in this area since we moved here. Nice. And right afterward, Nathan decided to make a, a video, and it was awesome. He made, it was the first episode, first ever, of the Endangered Patriot Rebel Cast. Awesome name. Oh, and you can yeah. check that out over on Facebook. We even shared it over at uh, Facebook.com slash Paleo Radio. Go check it yeah, out. Yeah, and we're looking forward to seeing a lot more of those episodes. It's going to be great. We also have a lot of great articles to run through today, don't we? We have tons of them, dude. We're going to start out talking about the claims made by Trump concerning, I don't know, shooting family members of terrorists or bringing back stuff worse than torture and what an ex-CIA chief has said about members of the military disobeying those orders. Awesome article. Next, we're going to find out about homeopathy not being effective in zero out of 68 illnesses. A big study was done on that. It's going to be very interesting. I think that's basically pretty profound. Yeah. It's not huge. a surprise. I don't think too much. It's but. massive. And, and, you know, and I've got friends who are into it. So it's going to be an interesting thing. Controversial for sure. And then after that, we're going to talk about former Petraeus advisor, Lieutenant Colonel David Kilcullen, saying no ISIS if we didn't invade Iraq. It's something I think you and I have believed for a long time, but this is somebody, high-profile figure, much much higher, pay grade well above us. Absolutely. It's not a unique idea. There's a lot of people who feel that way as well. Then we're going to finish off with... David Brooks, The Governing Cancer of Our Time, which is a fantastic article from the New York Times. That one is going to be a lot of fun. Those are four amazing topics all in a row. Oh, they are dandies. All right, we're going to start out here. The whole thing with Trump, Joe. Yes. I mean, come on now. The The idea, and people, if you, if you haven't heard it from the horse's mouth, it's all over the internet. You can go and find it. No doubt about it. But the idea that, that Trump's put out there, that he would not only bring back waterboarding, But that waterboarding is kind of a wussified kind of torture, and maybe we should try something a little bit more medieval. Yeah, he said, quote, I would bring back waterboarding, and I'd bring back a hell of a lot worse than waterboarding. Mm. So, yeah, I think, yeah, maybe thinking the old school (laughs) rack or something like that. What is he thinking? And here's the thing. Every time he talks about it, he always says, well, but there are savages. They're cutting people's heads off. Totally true. You know, they're cutting people's heads off. But is that kind of the measuring stick you're using? (laughs) Is this a hint? Because he's never said what the other kinds are, the more hardcore ones that are more dramatic. He's never said what these things are. And (laughs) well, unbelievable. Far be it from Trump to drop a level lower instead of going a level higher. So to me, that's right with expectation. He would try to meet them at their level. He would try to meet him at their level and just start clopping heads off. Yeah. And not only heads of, of terrorists, but also possibly terrorist families. Maybe some kids, maybe some wives, maybe some old people. Well, yeah. It doesn't necessarily matter that they're connected, but it's something we're definitely going to do. Yeah. So there was, <laughs> there was two, ma- two major quotes that he relied on, right? The one about waterboarding, and then he had talked about killing terrorist families, mm-hmm. you know, and saying you have to go after them. And there was a uh, member of the National Security Agency that was on Bill Maher's show a little while back that had discussed this exact thing. Right. The former director of the Central Intelligence Agency and the National Security Agency said Friday that the military would have to disobey Donald Trump if he followed through on certain campaign promises as president. These are the ones we've just talked about. Referring to Trump's suggestion to torture suspected terrorists and kill their families, General Michael Hayden told TV host Bill Maher, quote, If he were to order that once in government, the American armed forces would refuse to act. He went further and said this. 
you're required not to follow an unlawful order. That would be in violation of all the international laws of armed conflict. I would be incredibly concerned if a President Trump governed in a way that was consistent with the language candidate Trump expressed during the campaign. Well, absolutely. He opens up a pretty interesting bag of worms there, though, I think, to say that they're not required to uh, respond to an order that's illegal or against the law. So the individual soldier is drilled repeatedly over and over again about all the rights that they have to disobey the orders of their higher-ups in the military? That's news to me. Well, it's kind of news to me, and I, I went through basic training in the U.S. Navy. I mean, it was something we didn't hear much about that. And I was an education petty officer. That's what I, That was my role within the division that I was part of. And so it was something I probably should have known or should have been told or should have read somewhere about what are the parameters of this. Because when you get in, my experience, and this is anecdotal, take it for what it's worth, when I was in, I was told a lot of times by superiors of mine that if they gave me an order, that I had to obey that order. And that if I didn't, I would go to the brig. And here's the thing. I don't have an answer exactly on this. I really don't. I don't know where that line is. Um, and I think that a lot of a lot of people, especially enlisted people in the military, they also don't know where that line is. But one thing's for sure. Let's say that there's a situation where a sailor says, I'm not going to obey that order. I think it's wrong. Go torture this kid over there. We heard he, she's related to a terrorist. If that, if that sailor says, I'm not going to go and do that, that sailor for a time may be put in the brig, may not be treated right, may even be shuffled out with a, a dishonorable discharge or a general under honorable or something. That kind of thing can and probably does happen. But unless people actually know what the rules are and what they're able to say no to, that's a hard thing. You can say it all day long, but when the rubber hits the road, if they don't know it, it's of no value whatsoever. It depends on what the president says and how that's reverberated amongst the people in the military. Because if no general takes up this order and stops him right there and says, you know, the people that are in the Oval Office talking to him and they're saying, listen, that's not that's not an option that we're going to be sending down to our troops, that we're going to be targeting civilians that aren't involved in, in the war. We're not going to do that. It's against the Geneva Convention. That'd be one thing. If we get down to the point where it is a sergeant telling privates what they're going to be doing, absolutely. The thing to me is this is a system designed this way. It's designed to work in a way that says your individuality is no longer here. You are a small peg in a humongous wheel, and if you disobey orders, you're screwing up the wheel, and we don't deal with that, period. I mean, your job is to do what you're told. That's I'd be it. interested in seeing different models of military participation and programming. Honestly, it's what it is when you bring somebody in and you break them down to build them back up and you're with ideas like honor, you know, integrity, that kind of thing, sacrifice. But I'm kind of unaware of any idea that really for a military, some kind of a theory that would say in practice, when you bring people into basic training, that we can maximize individuality or at least respect. It. I don't even know if those things are compatible with even the overarching idea of what an army or military is. I don't think they're compatible at all. That's why I think it's kind of a loosely said thing, except for the the one out that I believe um, Michael Hayden has is the fact that people don't swear an oath to the President of the United States when they join the military. They swear an oath to the Constitution. I think that makes a big difference, being that if it's in violation of the Constitution, in theory, soldiers do have a, a right to stand out for that. In practice, is it true? Uh, I don't I don't think so. There's probably an answer in the Uniform Code of Military Justice. It's been a long time since I've dusted it off, and I didn't before the show. But it's probably the place where you would find it, and it would be still, even so, it's a difficult thing, and I don't know many sailors that really emphasize, or people in the military, that do what they ought to do and really investigate and read it. I mean, and hey, I'm guilty of this. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't sit there and devour it and try to understand it to my best, and I probably ought to have. I mean, no doubt about it. And But listen, Hayden, people might say, well, who exactly is Hayden? I mean, sure, he's the, uh, he's the ex-CIA chief, but who is he beyond that? According to Breitbart, Hayden is a retired four-star general, 
highly respected on both sides of the aisle. He served under presidents in both parties. He served for 41 years in the U.S. Air Force, was director of the National Security Agency for six years, CIA director for three years, and currently works as a business partner of former Homeland Security Secretary Michael Chertoff. Yeah, so he's a little bit accredited. A little bit. I mean, he's been around things for a minute. And involved in some programs that I detest, but still he's accredited to the system. I'll give him that. Yeah, he's got, he's got Hillary Clinton's experience check mark. Yeah, that's, there you go. I mean, I'm not trying to be disingenuous to his track record. I do think he knows what he's talking about. Um, it is to say, though, that you know, the NSA is not something that I'm particularly fond of. But on this, he's definitely an authority. He would Absolutely. know. He would know the law in, in question here, whether or not people in the military would have to obey. Such an order. And you mentioned something earlier saying, you know, it would be in violation of international law. And it got me to thinking in the article here, unlike many other countries, U.S. military officers do not swear an oath of obedience to the commander in chief. Instead, pursuant to Article six of the Constitution, every commissioned officer takes an oath to, quote, support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. End quote. It makes no mention of the president at all. Or of the chain of command. And what was cool about this was the reasoning why. It's because in America's form of government, the president is a public servant, tasked by the Constitution to, quote, take care that the laws be faithfully executed, end quote. As a consequence, the president has no authority to order military commanders to do something that would violate the law. In fact, if the law and the president are ever in conflict, every military officer is required to obey the former and disobey the latter. There you go. Which is in direct contradiction to what uh, Mr. Trump said at the Fox News debate. Totally, right? 100%. Where he said, quote, they won't refuse. They're not going to refuse me. If I say to do it, they're going to do it. That is totally authoritarian. And it, it misses a really old kind of conclusion that we've drawn that we are a nation that's Lex Rex and not Rex Lex. The law is king. King is not law. That's the United States. That would make America great again. Yeah, that would make America great again. Having an authoritarian figure that says he's going to burl his way through everybody's opinions and just get them to do what he says is not the answer that we want. Up next, homeopathy not being very effective. But we are. Stick around. Love Paleo Radio? Join the club. Support our work by visiting patreon.com slash paleo radio today. Back to Eagle and Dragon. I gotta say, we missed something monumental, Joe. Yeah, we did. We did. We totally failed everybody on this, and we need to apologize. We totally forgot to say happy birthday to our friend John Mosman. Yeah, John Mosman is the big 35. We want to wish you a happy birthday, buddy. We love you. You can follow John over at real underscore JL Moseman. That's M-O-S-E-M-A-N. On Twitter, he's a moderate conservative Christian blogger and podcaster bringing passion, humor, and honest perspective. Find out more about him by going to jlmoseman.net. And I got to say, he's a fantastic human being. You know, we live in a world where we understand that not everybody's going to agree and we can set some differences aside. It, You know, the Christians that are in the world today, there are good Christians. John Moseman's one of them. He is a good, classy guy, and we wish him a happy birthday. Happy birthday, buddy. Okay, so we're going to get into homeopathy here. I have a Live Science article by Christopher Wanjik, which is just a brief explanation of what homeopathy is, and then we'll get into its effectiveness. Homeopathy is an alternative medical practice in which extremely dilute amounts of certain substances that are natural are used to treat various ailments. Although homeopathic medicines are sold in health food stores and at high-end groceries, homeopathy is largely considered quackery. No scientific evidence supports its use, the theory of how homeopathy could work is beyond the realm of known physics, and governments worldwide are increasingly denying insurance payments to cover homeopathic treatment. So there was, there was a study done. There was a massive study done. This is an article out of The Independent. It's called Homeopathy Effective for Zero Out of 68 Illnesses, a Study Finds. It's by Sibion Fenton. A leading scientist has declared homeopathy a, quote, therapeutic dead end after a systematic review concluded the controversial treatment was no more effective than placebo drugs. 
Professor Paul Glazow, a leading academic in evidence-based medicine at Bond University, was the chair of a working party by the National Health and Medical Research Council, which was tasked with reviewing the evidence of 176 trials of homeopathy to establish if the treatment is valid. And it said right here, a total of 57 systematic reviews containing the 176 individual studies focused on 68 different health conditions and found there to be no evidence homeopathy was more effective than placebo on any. On any. On any. Uh, that This is so... <laughs> this is a big deal. You have this many different studies, that many systematic reviews, focusing on that many different health conditions, and to walk away saying, hey, listen, none of these things were any better. They performed no mm-hmm. better in any of these ways than a placebo. Massive. Yeah, I mean, massive. And the proof is in the pudding. Glazow states, quote, As chair of the working party which produced the report, I simply was relieved that the arduous journey of sifting through and synthesizing the evidence was at an end. I had begun the journey with a, quote, I don't know attitude, curious of whether this unlikely treatment could ever work. But I lost interest after looking at 57 systematic reviews which contained 176 individual studies and found no discernible evidence convincing effects beyond placebo. And that's his own quote. And he wrote that over at the British Medical Journal. Yes, he did. And a blog for them. And just to give you guys a little bit more information, I'm skipping back to the Live Science article. Homeopathy was developed in the late 18th century by Samuel Hahnemann, a respected doctor in Germany. Hahnemann believed that like cures like, and that minute concentrations of a particular toxin could cure the very same symptoms it would cause in larger doses. Think poison ivy to treat rashes. You know, you hear this a lot, actually. And yeah. I listen, I've got close friends. I said this in the intro. I've got close friends who, who believe in this, people who believe in the essential oils or that may believe in homeopathy, naturopathy. Yes. You know, I mean, all of these, all of these different things. And yet, what do you do? Well, I mean, <laughs> you're up against a wall. I, I don't know what to say other than, hey, this is a big deal. And listen to what you said. I've heard that from every every one of them where if they say, hey, uh, this might cause some stomach pains, but you're fighting stomach pains with stomach pains. The idea, the philosophy of fighting fire with fire. But it, when you say things like that, fighting a rash with poison ivy. That's a little, and most of them would say, well, no, of course, that sounds crazy. We would never That's do right, that. But they would say it's another thing that causes a rash on that. Right. Or, but it's a lesser, a lesser version of the rash. But, you know, we have to, it just has to be mentioned that this, again, it happened in the 18th century. It was at a time where common medical practice was things like bloodletting. So the idea of like cures like really could hold some weight back in the 18th century. But now we have advanced science and we have a way of evaluating it to a point where we can we can have discernible evidence if it's useful or not. And that's where we need to change our minds. To me, I think it's people have a fascination with looking back into old books and assuming that there's hidden gems in there the same way that there's diamonds inside of a mine somewhere. And I'm not going to sit here and say that there's not some here or there, but for medical practices, no way. You're not going to find something 2,000 years ago that is the better the better treatment for modern day medicine today. You we may find something that has been used all along for a long period of time that's withstood the test of time and has proven to be a good medicine that has been used since a certain date. Yes, I'll I think that's wasn't true. Wasn't there wasn't there the Nobel went to somebody who was using was it mushrooms? Yeah. I think or some kind of an old uh, Chinese folk remedy yes. and used it and that it, they said that it, there were benefits to it. Sure. I'm wondering how that plays in or does not play in in this discussion. Sure. Well, I think it does. I mean, but the reason why she got her Nobel Prize is because the proof was in the pudding of her studies. I think you're right. We'll have to look this up. I think it was on mushrooms. Mm-hmm. But th- when she took it and put it against the actual modern day test of science to see if it's valid or not, it passed. That's that is something that we can do. The idea of going back to homeopathy and saying, I think homeopathy works, but I don't want to put it to the standards of modern day science, but it works. I think that's that's a moment to call BS, which is what they do. They did that in Switzerland. Yeah. I mean, that was a country because they that country came to a different conclusion. Yes. Right. I mean, there was a piece. Where was that? It was over at Huffington Post. Well, yeah, the somebody from Switzerland came with uh, up with that. But the. Well, the Swiss government, the, the Swiss, Swiss government report on homeopathic medicine uh, that they were saying was the most comprehensive evaluation that had ever been written by the government. 
And they came to the conclusion that it was it was really a good thing. I mean, it said not only did it have comprehensive review of the body of evidence from randomized, double-blind, and placebo-controlled clinical trials, but at the end, they believe that it was, what did they say? The Swiss report found a particularly strong body of evidence to support the homeopathic treatment of things like, for example, upper respiratory tract infections and respiratory allergies. It cites a whole bunch of things. The only problem is they used things like, quote, real world effectiveness. What's that? Right. Which is kind of this speak for, like the article says, poorly controlled studies. <laughs> it just kind of is. Yeah. They factored in all of these different things. And what did it say? I think like 50 percent of Switzerland, the people in Switzerland believe in that kind of thing anyway. So they're yeah. already tilted in that direction. I think the question is, again, the the Swiss government didn't say we did a series of 58 tests on 176 different examples looking at 68 illnesses and found X, Y, and Z. They said, no, overall it's effective, it's good, and we've compared it to real-world standards. What in the world does that yeah. even mean? It said, it said they also evaluated the, quote, real-world effectiveness as well as safety and cost effectiveness. The report also conducted a highly comprehensive review of the wide body of preclinical research fundamental physiochemical research, botanical studies, animal studies, and in vitro studies with human cells. But listen, that's Switzerland, right? But then you have the United Kingdom. <laughs> the United mm. Kingdom, they came out with something. This is over at sciencebasedmedicine.org. you got to go check it out. It says, in 2010, the UK government performed their own systematic review of homeopathy. In their report, they concluded that homeopathy is essentially witchcraft, that it does not work, its underlying principles are scientifically invalid and tantamount to magic, that it should not be covered by the National Health Service, and that it is not even worth any further research. And so I And it's not <laughs> just kinda... it's not just England. I mean the, the scientific community has come out and strongly opposed the uh, Swiss report. This is science based medicine. In 2011, the Swiss government completed an official examination of homeopathy as part of its consideration of whether or not to insure it. Dana Allman, writing of the Huffington Post, was quick to proclaim the virtues of the Swiss report and touted as evidence for its effectiveness of homeopathy. Recently, however, a more critical review of the Swiss report has been published, revealing the report to be biased and scientifically suspect. There's also some reports that have gone after the Swiss government for, right. for their portrayal. Why, why do you think it is, man, that we're seeing kind of almost like a resurgence of interest in things like chakras? What is the reason for this? Well, I think there's there's a response to Big Pharma. I think more of a logical explanation, but I think the general one is most people do seriously think that healthcare was better at a certain time back in certain days that more people were dying. I mean, literally, that's what they think. They think that some use of back then, a whole practice just got rolled over by modern medicine and there's other ways to cure their, cure your body, but... I think the difference is, and I, we already talked about this, is they're not willing to put that up to scientific scrutiny because they say the scientific system is flawed. And that is their own bias defending themselves from serious scrutiny of their ideas. Because it doesn't seem to ever rise to the occasion. Never. Never. And, you know, I've tried many different times, in fact. And I, I tried many different kinds of things. I, because I have anxiety, I've tried the oils. Like lavender, for example. There's been times where I said, hey, I feel a little bit calmer. But there's been times where I have put it on and went straight into a full-blown panic attack. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, that didn't really really help out. You've got, you've got things that I've done, for example, for my, for my stomach. Or things for skin conditions. I, I, uh, Ambrose, one of my sons, he has a skin condition. We've tried that. And we've tried things going back for years and years. But a lot of those bottles wouldn't be used the whole way. In fact, it was really rare that any of them were. Mm -hmm. And part of that was just because when I had the choice as a person in the VA that has access to these medicines, uh, to different kinds, and I had the choice of that or the choice of taking something natural that was done with uh, homeopathy, I always wanted to try the homeopathy one because I didn't like the side effects of the other ones. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it would not relieve the things that it claimed to relieve. Sure. I, and as I said, I, it just anecdotally, just from my own experiences in my life, it just kind of became one of those things where I really, I got really suspect even looking at bottles or thinking yeah. about these things to say, you know, I just don't know, no offense, it's just not, 
it doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> I don't I don't mean to be mean, but it doesn't work. It doesn't work. I think the best way of putting it is, hey, if placebo effects have a positive reaction on people, if you think it helps you, go ahead. Walking around telling people it works, you need to put I think in front of that. We'll be right back, right after this, talking about whether ISIS would exist if it wasn't for the war in Iraq. If you leave, you can't come back in. Pedo Radio will return. Now back to Joe and Jeremiah. Dude, we got a tweet from Paul Begala. We did. Yeah, Paul Begala. Well, you got a response from Paul Begala. I got a response. It happened. I wrote this. I wrote, ugh, Paul Begala on CNN Breaking News. Sigh. He's probably the all-time worst partisan robot. That much I can tell you. Salah at CNN. And he got this back. He said, so is that good, like in Star Wars, charming robot way? And I said, it's more in the ballpark of Vicky from Small Wonder, or maybe Tweaky from Buck Rogers. <laughs> Nowhere near Johnny Five, much less R2-D2. Which, if you don't know who Johnny Five is, you're a very young person, you need to Google it. And if you don't know who Paul Begala is, you're probably sleeping well at night. Yeah, I would, I'd have to think <laughs> no that, No offense, too. Paul, but you kind of suck. No offense. <laughs> I don't say that. Listen, I don't say that about very many people, but he's, he's a real douche. He is. Yeah. He really is. All right. Former Petraeus advisor, Lieutenant Colonel David Kilcullen, no ISIS if we didn't invade Iraq. This is out of warincontext.org. The greatest strategic screw-up since Hitler's invasion of Russia. That's how David Kilcullen describes George W. Bush's invasion of Iraq in 2003. If anyone thinks that this is a throwaway line, they should read on. For it comes from one of the architects of the 2007-2008 surge into Iraq that sought to restore security to a society of the U.S.-led occupation and to create space to rebuild its state that it destroyed. Yeah. You know, I, I watched the video. I watched the interview with him, and it's definitely worth people's time. I would encourage everybody, once again, former Petraeus advisor, Lieutenant Colonel David Kilcullen, no ISIS if we didn't invade Iraq. And it's very, he's very forthright about it. You know, and he takes a position. I don't agree with everything he's saying about what should have been done or what could have been done. But I thought he brought up some really great things. And listen, the guy was a, a lieutenant colonel in the Australian Army. He served in Iraq and Afghanistan. He's a scholar steeped in counterinsurgency theory, uh, watching closely and keeping notes as this enormous slow motion train wreck took place. And in 2007, he was seconded to U.S. forces as chief advisor to General David Petraeus, commander of the surge. This strategy combined a big influx of American troops with co-opted Sunni tribal fighters to defeat Iraq. I remember when the surge was being pushed. Oh, yeah. I mean, I remember this very well. In fact, the newspaper I worked for at Olivet had me write an op-ed on it, and it was called Bush Contra Mundum, and it's one of my favorite things I've ever written. But I, th this is something that was really profound, and to have one of the architects of this thing, the second in command to Petraeus, for that guy to come out and make statements like this is profound. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely profound. They go on to write, The jihadis, later to transmute into the far greater threat of ISIS, had virtually no presence in Iraq prior to this invasion, but used it to turn the country into a charnel house and trigger the region-wide war that began the Sunni and Shia Islam that is now ripping Syria apart. Yeah, and that without that, it simply wouldn't have happened. Yeah. You know, that you have... You have the kind of culture and the atmosphere and the environment. All the all the goodies are there. All the essentials and preconditions for chaos were all present. Oh, yeah. For years. Definitely. For years. The kind of fear that people had having doors kicked in, you know, surprise, surprise, we're here with some guns. You might be a bad guy. Sorry, we shot your dog. That kind of a thing. That was something that happened. How many videos, man, did we see that WikiLeaks shared? I mean that that that's real. Remember the puppy being thrown over the I do the bridge. I think that took place in Afghanistan. But this is the kind of thing, not only for our troops, but also for the people there. And you look and you say, from that chaotic cesspool arose what we now call this death cult, ISIS. What really I think is the big kicker there is saying that we we did align ourselves with the Sunni tribal fighters, and when we did that, that really said that to people in Iraq that the Sunnis, quote-unquote, have chosen a side. They're going with the Western 
culture here to try to gain power. So after America lost its attention span and decides to ease back out of that, the Sunni Shia war rises up with people using rhetoric like the Sunnis aren't real Muslims. They want the Western culture. They'll work with the evils of the Western world. And here you go into the rhetoric and the propaganda can just churn itself out naturally. You mix that with a destabilized country. And you mix that with a bunch of military leaders who have religious affiliations that they're willing to fight and die for, and boom, you have an ISIS in Syria, and you have a full-blown regional war. What do you think? It says he believed that the idea with the surge that it worked, and that part of the reason is that we left too soon. Not only that we have this limited, exhausted attention span, but also that we pulled out our troops too quickly. And he says Obama made a promise to do it. Even though he was advised to the contrary, he still made good on that promise. And at the time, I was really excited about that. And I think that that was a good thing. It wasn't paraded very well. There wasn't much partying going on with that. But at the same time, I thought it was a good idea. In hindsight, is there an argument to be made that the surge that we should have remained a presence or retained a presence there? I think it depends on where you want to start the story. If we start the story in saying that us being in Iraq and destabilizing that whole entire nation, um, if that was something that had to have happened and we already did it, then yes, I would say we had to stay out. But I really think fighting this battle of ideology with bombs and bullets is not ever going to solve it. We'll be in perpetual warfare, and we're also assuming responsibility in regions that are sovereign and not our responsibility to take. Yeah, and if you have... A military over there. Militaries are not nation-building no, enterprises. They they're are, destroyers. They're destroyers. Oh, totally. They break things down, and they kill people. <laughs> That's kind of the, the MO here for the military. The idea that they can just flip a hat and that they can do that, or that our contractors, right, that are, oh, well, maybe the military can't do it, so let's go ahead and put some contractors, and let's appoint some politicians. Mind you, we don't believe that the politicians we have here are any darn good at all. We think they're terrible people. There's a populist uprising against the establishment and against D.C. But for some really weird reason, we kind of think that maybe if they put somebody in power over there and we kind of just meddled a little bit longer that we wouldn't be asking the same question down the road, Mm -hmm. two years down the road leaving, is it still too early? Have we transitioned enough? Have we done it? I just don't know if regime change and nation building... I don't know how often you're going to get a good result from that that's going to make it a comfortable exit. Well, you you won't because regime change is only from the perspective of the country with enough power to try to change them to the wills and wishes of said country. So when you look at America, America's interests are not Iraq's interests. And so, yes, of course, it would be in our best interest to manipulate that government to do what we want. But overall, is that going to yield positive results in that area? Absolutely not. And it's also, it's just a huge undertaking. We're talking about consistently maintaining that area. And I just think that this is why we don't get into things like perpetual warfare. It's why we have to have declarations of war and why we have to have constitutional approval and congressional approval to go to war. Because without it, we're stuck in these limbo regions. This is... Nation building is just the new term for colonization. We're colonizing Iraq in the attempt to take most of their resources, and we're not doing a very good job because we don't want to plant our flag there, so it's just a destabilized area while we still take their resources. And I think that this idea of perpetuating that longer and longer because it's for the betterment of the citizens there is, um, I, I think it's not right. I think it's incorrect. When asked about what led to the rise of ISIS, it was the answer was the invasion of Iraq. It's the largest military blunder, like you said in the beginning, quoting it, that it was the largest blunder since Germany invaded Russia in 1941. Uh, he said there would undoubtedly be no ISIS if we didn't invade Iraq. But he said also that the decision to leave Iraq in 2011 without consolidating the political process, as well as the failure to react to violence in Syria and the way that Libya fell apart in 2011... What do you make of those? I think that ends up being a wild goose chase. I mean, how logical would it be to try to drone strike the mafia in Italy? (laughs) Not very logical. But that's because we value the lives of Italian people more. Truth. I mean, that's the reason why we wouldn't do such a thing. And we're trying to do this idea of we're going to go bust up the gangs over there. It's more like we're trying to find Bloods and Crips in America 
to shoot down, then you're actually going against an organized government. There's communication going on. There's, you know, drug running going on. There's all these things that Bloods and Crips are doing in America. But the idea of using the military to sweep them out is, I mean, it's ludicrous. In each one of these, each one of these places, Iraq, Syria, and Libya, they had strong men that literally, for better or worse, through force and fear sometimes and death, provided order. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's ter- it's a terrible thing to say. It's kind of a realistic position to hold. But to sit there and go, you look at each one of these things, and each one of those are when we got in and said, we don't like your strongman leader. We're taking that guy out, and you need to change it. And each one of those, you got Syria, Libya, and Iraq. Mm-hmm. And say, that created ISIS. Yes, well, okay. <laughs> that created ISIS. So with the strongmen, ISIS is pushed down. Well, we that's cre- the choice. We created a power vacuum, and then we walked away from it. Is That's exactly what we did. And now people can say, it's the fact that you walked away that things are this way. No, sir. It's the fact that we created a vacuum. The fact that a vacuum is there and it was created by us destabilizing the region by knocking out the dictator that was in power, that's the reason why it's bad. However long we want to sit around and keep shooting our guns into the Middle East and firing our weapons into the Middle East... It's irrelevant to the fact that we made the power vacuum that warlords are fighting for in the Middle East. And that's the reason why we're having these issues. I liked what he said when he said, with ISIS, you can't fight without fighting. You know, if you want to move forward, you have to know where you are. There's a mismatch between goals and means and objectives. And that, to me, I I thought that stood out the most when he's like, listen, you have to ask yourself, what are you actually trying to accomplish? What can you reasonably even accomplish whatsoever? And if you've been trying something and it appears too lofty and it's taken uh, this long and the results suck, then you need to go back and really kind of reevaluate the entire idea of means and objectives. These are very expensive goals. It's what he said. A lot of times unwilling to provide resources. That's a problem. If the situation requires certain resources and those resources are very expensive and you don't have the money and maybe even the popular interest to do it, then maybe that's just a bad idea. That's right. I mean, I don't... (laughs) But at the same time, there's a serious problem over there. When he said the situation with Syria, not addressing the violence, maybe, but the idea of going in with missiles and drones... I don't know if that's what he meant, but I I wouldn't go that route. No. And we have to own up to the fact that we sided with one sect of this religious fight, and that is the reason why there's infighting going on in that area. It would be the same thing as if it happened in the U.S. and we paired with al-Qaeda to fight here, and how would people in America view that group of people? It's that simple. And hey, unsurprisingly, Ron Paul totally agrees with you. Here's a quote from him. I would think that if you don't like ISIS... Just walk away, and Syria and Iran will take care of them, and they'll get rid of all the radicals, just as Saddam Hussein did. There was no al-Qaeda in Iraq when Saddam Hussein was president, and there's no al-Qaeda in Iran. Hey, shout out to the Young Turks for being picked up by WME. Congratulations, you guys. Stick around. Paleo Radio will return. For debates, interviews, or speeches, contact Paleo Radio Show at gmail.com. You love to hate them, you hate to love them. You just can't get enough of them, you sick freaks. Paleo Radio's on the air. We want to shout out to Scott Horton of The Scott Horton Show, which is in KPFK in LA, Liberty Radio Network. He sent us a pretty interesting article that we uh, read on antiwar.com. I want to thank him for that. He's a fantastic guy. I love following him on Twitter. He's real edgy. And we, hey, we had a tweet that was liked over by Dave Rubin from the Rubin Report. And listen, if you've never seen the Rubin Report, you're missing out. Fantastic interviews. One of my favorite interviewers right now. You got to go check him out. It's Dave Rubin at Rubin Report on Twitter. There's an article over here, Joe. We both loved it. I mean, literally, this this is a work of poetic genius, right? It's the bee's knees. <laughs> it's the bee's knees. And in fact, we're probably going to read a lot from it. it literally, it's it's beautifully done. It's proverbial. I mean, you could literally read it with your with your eggs and bacon in the morning, and it would just help you throughout the day to be just a better human being, probably, <laughs> <laughs> and 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 lead to a better a better country. But it's written. By David Brooks over at New York Times, it's called The Governing Cancer of Our Time. And he begins by saying this. We live in a big, diverse society. 
There are essentially two ways to maintain order and get things done in such a society. Politics are some form of dictatorship, either through compromise or brute force. Our founding fathers chose politics. Politics is an activity in which you recognize the simultaneous existence of different groups, interests, and opinions. And I listen, I'm not even moving on anymore. <laughs> just stopping right there. Let's just one more time and we can talk about it. Politics is an activity in which you recognize the simultaneous existence of different groups, interests, and opinions. It's a, yeah, reality is outside your brain, folks. Yeah, and I think that's why there's a lot of people that don't like politics in general just because it's bringing on this idea of, of being conflicted and having to look through certain things and get more information about things to make your decisions. There's a lot of people that just feel, I've already made my decision. I don't want to be influenced in any way. And they're, they've kind of been coerced into this thinking that politics is a bad thing. It's a negative thing like a, like a lawyer is even though people actually have lawyers for a lot of good reasons. Right. But they only think of a lawyer and they think, oh, man, this person is detestable. They're awful. They do X or Y or Z or when whatever. When they're in a jam. And it's the same exact thing with politicians in the political system because exactly as Brooks writes, it is the recognition of other ideas and groups. I used to think of it like this and say, if you have, let's imagine, six different tribes, six different groups that are kind of situated and they're all separated and everything, and let's say that they want to get together and they want to have their own kind of independence. And yet at the same time, they want to trade. They want to maybe intermarry. They want to do all these other things, but yet retain their individualism of, of the tribe. They want to retain their totems. If you want that, you have to come up with some kind of political scheme that says we recognize and respect the existence of different groups and opinions and interests. Or you're going to have... In all likelihood, in the way it plays out in history, you're going to have one of those groups, typically the ones that are pretty strong and pretty brash, that say, hey, folks, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to all do it our way. And I said, you know, if you take that and you look at society at large, microcosm, macrocosm. I don't think it's too twilight zony to think about it like it's basically implied within itself. If you want the individuality, you have to make a rule. You have to have the group acknowledge rules that give you the individuality. I mean, if there's other groups there. Otherwise, we're just talking about the biggest group with the biggest sticks. And that's the one that makes all the rules anyway. Where's your individuality there? It's gone. So, I mean, this is why I disagree with the anarchistic principle. The idea that we can do this all in a on a voluntary basis and we can get all our own goods. It doesn't work like that when somebody doesn't adhere to your system and works from the outside of it. What do you do to deal with that person? We all have to collectively get together and make decisions of how you deal with them. What are you doing? You're governing what you're going to do in your community when you get in a little group and decide. And I just think that it's just a game that we play here. I mean, if you want anything organized with more than 10 people, in a way, it's political governance. You know, and I'm glad that David Brooks said what he said here then. You try to find some way to balance or reconcile or compromise those interests or at least a majority of them. Because I, I'm with you, you know, and I saw, I, when I reported on Occupy and I was involved with Occupy, I saw the consensus model in action. And I, I realized just how similar it was to the models of, of ecclesiastical government um, with the Baptist churches and congregational churches. And I said, there's a reason why we have a lot of different Baptist churches. Oh, yeah. And buggers split, like, <laughs> really, really fast. Over disagreements over... about how many pews should have been in the chapel and stuff, probably, sometimes. Yeah, because what do you do? I mean, you're going to... Ha there's going to be an impasse. And what happens at the impasse? But anyway, you try to balance these things out, and you at least try. You at least try to get the majority of them. You follow a set of rules enshrined in a constitution or in a custom to help you reach these compromises in a way everybody considers legitimate. Now, I would have said uh, the majority of people consider legitimate. I think he did well the first time around. He shouldn't have said everybody because you're not going to have that. That's a tough sell big time. Yeah, it's a very tough sell. But he moves into getting more specific with American culture and, uh, well, I guess international culture as well when he says, Over the past generation, we have seen the rise of a group of people who are against politics. These groups, best exemplified by the Tea Party, but not exclusive to the right, want to elect people who have no political experience. They want, quote, outsiders. They delegitimize compromise and deal-making. 
They're willing to trample on the customs and rules that give legitimacy to the legislative decision making if it helps to gain power, mm-hmm. which I think is that is just spot on. He goes on to say, ultimately, they don't recognize other people. They suffer from a form of political narcissism in which they don't accept the legitimacy of other interests and other opinions. They don't recognize restraints. They want total victories for themselves and their doctrine. It sounds almost Freudian, like the civilization and its discontents, the idea that one of the real problems is that other people are outside of our brain. (laughs) There's other people here. You're going to be in the utopia or we'll kick you out of the whole thing. Right. right? So they don't recognize other people. And in the idea of they don't accept the legitimacy of other interests and opinions, I wonder how much of that is kind of going along with the evolution in American history with Protestantism. The idea that there's no, I mean, we're very Protestant (laughs) as a nation. It's almost, it's a defining characteristic in many ways. And like Brooks says, the downside of politics is that people never really get everything they want. I mean, we all know that. That, Doesn't that seem to just be right at the (laughs) forefront of everybody's mind this election year is that even with the high hopes we've had in certain presidential candidates, that it seems like this constant... Uh, Groundhog Day replay of betrayal, <laughs> scandal, and lies, and, and all this stuff. And it seems that way. Oh, it does seem that way. And it always continues to seem that way when people don't work within the process. So the process falls into stagnation, right? That's exactly what we're seeing in the first place. I think so. You know, and <sighs> even when you get something really good, something you want, like let's say, take for example, the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act is better than what we had before. But how many of us that were fighting for expanded health care were really bummed out at the fact that it wasn't single payer, some kind of public option? Disappointment is part of the game. Yeah. It, it really is. There's a lot of high hopes that people have. We talked about this actually on our last episode, about when we talked about Bernie splaining. This is something that the African American community in the United States has really come to understand is that you hear all of these promises, you hear all of these uh, accomplishments, and even in the accomplishments that are touted, that even there, there's always an element of disappointment. Yeah, and in the deal-making process, I mean, a good way to think about it in a business-like form is when you make a deal, you're lucky to have it be pretty even and you feel like you came out just a little bit on top, and that's all deal-making is. I mean, you're not the type of person that gets 100% of everything you want all the time. I mean, that's just... It, that's the same thing. I mean, this kind of what Trump does. It's the same thing as saying I'm a professional fighter and I've never lost a fight in my life. I mean, the likelihood of that is is pretty unreal. You know, Bernard Crick, he wrote in this book in defense of politics, quoted by Brooks, and it says, quote, politics is a way of ruling divided societies without undue violence. And I that's a keeper for me. I mean, I almost want that on my wall. I'm serious, and it's it's one of the reasons why I'm not a libertarian, because I like that without undue violence part. Yeah. You know, that's that is better. <laughs> that better reflects my personal views on politics than, let's say, a more absolutist position on the non-aggression principle. I think so, and it also implies that there is a little bit of violence that comes with the whole process in the first place, and it, it can't go without. There's this anti-government sentiment, mainly on the right. He mentions the Tea Party. But that they're enthralled with this whole Mr. Smith goes to Washington narrative. Totally. Have you ever seen that movie? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I like, thought it was badass when I was 18 and I grew out of it just like Ayn Rand. <laughs> it's true. And you say, boy, this is, but it sounds charming. It sounds delightful. And Amer- as American as apple pie, uh, at least in kind of this lofty, lofty myth-like narrative way. But they want outsiders. And in comes the outsider with Mr. Trump. And so then you have here what David Brooks writes. Trump supporters aren't looking for a political process to address their needs. They're looking for a superhero. As the political scientist Matthew McWilliams found, the one trait that best predicts whether you're a Trump supporter is how high you score on tests that measure authoritarianism. If you think about, you know, Mr. Smith goes to Washington, almost everything he was doing was authoritarian. I'm not listening to any of your jargon anymore. My rules supersede all of your rules. I'm going to filibuster here for X amount of hours. That was the whole premise of it, is that he was going to make... Huge influential changes, and they all were his, and he got every one of them to go his way. And it's just not practical. At the end of this article, it says, consider the vicious cycle. And there's three examples, and they're just, I mean, this is literally like, thus spoke Zarathustra brilliant here. 
The anti-politics people elect legislators who have no political skills or experience. That incompetence leads to dysfunctional government, which leads to more disgust with government, which leads to a demand for even more outsiders. The anti-politics people don't accept that politics is a limited activity. They make soaring promises and raise ridiculous expectations. When those expectations are not met, voters grow cynical and, disgusted, turn even further in the direction of anti-politics. The anti-politics people refuse compromise and so block the legislative process. The absence of accomplishment destroys public trust. The decline in trust makes deal-making harder. People feel unheard, which makes them shout even louder, which further destroys conversation. I Listen, seriously, once again, you, if you want to give me a gift ever, <laughs> go ahead and just have that put on some kind of plaque I can put on my wall because it's, it's beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. The closing paragraph nails it as well. This isn't just an American phenomenon. Politics is in retreat and authoritarianism is on the rise worldwide. The answer to Trump is politics. It's acknowledging other people exist. It's taking pleasure in the difference and hammering out workable arrangements. As Harold Lasky put it, quote, We shall make the basis of our state consent on disagreement. Therein shall we ensure the deepest harmony. It's powerful. Go read the article. Genius New York Times. Listen, Joe, it's over, bro. It's all over. And man, how fast does it go? You've got something coming up this weekend. I do. I will be part of Laugh Fest. I will be at Sunday Night Funnies at the hotel on Ann Street here in Grand Rapids on Sunday, March 13th. You guys got to be there. Check it out. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. You've been listening to Paleo Radio exclusively with Secular Media Group. 